at Polygon, do we? That's true. Uh, and something we have started to do somewhat recently is the concept of a pre-review where we're... What, what is a pre-review? Explain this to me. I was confused when it was brought up in meetings. We do them all the time now. So what is a pre-review? I mean, it's kind of the, the, the concept that, you know, maybe a few weeks or a month in advance of a game's final release, we get to spend a considerable amount of time with it. In the case of uh, you know, Resident Evil 7, which was released recently, Phil got to go play that game for four hours or, or something like that. Or he got a build that he played for four hours and he, he wrote extensive preview impressions. But it's the kind of thing where it's like, hey, this game is just a few weeks or a month away. Here's where it stands right now. It may not have gone gold. It may not be final. But, you know, just to give you an updated, close-to-release impression of what the game is shaping up like... Here's a you know here's a couple hundred words on it and and that's um that's kind of where we were with Horizon Zero Dawn. I went to go play the game uh, at an LA studio for about four hours. Uh, started at the beginning of the game, played through the tutorial, the setup, and then jumped into a a mission that's uh, about seven chapters into the game from what Sony said. So you know I, I feel like I got a pretty decent impression of what the game is is gonna be. Um, but obviously there's still a, a, a review forthcoming. Uh, we're still waiting on review code for Horizon, which is hopefully going to be uh, here soon. I, I do want to find out your impressions on the game. Of course, Horizon Zero Dawn was announced at E3 2015. It was, wasn't really on anybody's radar. We knew that Guerrilla Games was doing something after the Kill Zone series, but we didn't expect this. What is Horizon Zero Dawn, Michael? So Horizon Zero Dawn is basically one of those big open world action adventure games that have become very popular uh, over the past decade. You know, it's kind of in the vein of uh, Rockstar Games' Grand Theft Auto or, or Red Dead Redemption title, or say Assassin's Creed, Far Cry, Watch Dogs from Ubisoft. These kind of like big open world adventures filled with quests, filled with things to collect and upgrade and people to interact with and and, and then hopefully a, a large overarching narrative that's going to be threaded throughout all these other stories that you play through over the course of the game. Um, so, you know, I, not to be too reductive, but Guerrilla Games has effectively made a very good Ubisoft game. Uh, and I don't mean that in a, in a bad way necessarily. Uh, you know, Ubisoft has been working and perfecting that formula over the course of multiple franchises and multiple games. and. And, uh, you know, Guerrilla Games, who are best known for making kill zone shooters, they were like, you know what? We'll make one of those too. And it seems like they've done a very capable job of doing that. Um, so if, you, if you're into those kinds of games and stuff like The Witcher or Skyrim, because this has a kind of primitive, almost, I don't know, medieval bent to it, um, then you're probably going to be into this. Uh, this is a PlayStation 4 exclusive. And... If you want a big, tasty, open-world action-adventure with lots of story, lots of dialogue, lots of things to see, uh, Horizon might be your cup of tea. Well, tell me about this world, though. That's really what's captivated people, I feel, since it was announced back in 2015. What is the world of Horizon Zero Dawn all about? Catch me up on this thing. Okay, so it's it described as a as a post-post-apocalyptic event uh, game. Uh, so, you know, uh, maybe a thousand years ago, something happened to our world to effectively send it back to the Stone Age. Uh, there, you know, um, humanity was effectively wiped out. All of our cities and infrastructure has been destroyed. Uh, but obviously there were survivors. And since then, they've, they've come back as a, as a society. Uh, there's still kind of a somewhat primitive uh, hunter-gatherer culture. Um, but in uh, the wake of humanity's near extinction, a, a new species has arisen, and they are uh, called machines in the game. Uh, and these are um, essentially robots that, that kind of mimic or, uh, or are, are easily compared to a lot of creatures in our real, real world. Uh, and that includes things like dinosaurs, panthers, um, gazelles, horses... Uh, so there's these fantastic-looking creatures that I think uh, have drawn a lot of comparisons to the toys uh, Zords, um, uh, but they're they're beautifully designed robots um, that act like uh, wildlife. Uh, and yes, there is wildlife in the world. Um, you can hunt for boars and turkeys and 
Uh, I'm not sure what else, but you know, it's that humanity uh, has survived along with a, a lot of other wildlife. Um, but it is these machines that kind of uh, threaten uh, humanity in its current state. Um, and uh, the, the culture uh, of Earth now has adapted to fight and survive um, uh, against this mechanical threat. Um, you play as Aloy. Uh, she is... Um, uh, her origins are somewhat mysterious. Uh, she is a, an outcast. Uh, we don't know why. Um, she is also an orphan. We don't know who her parents are. Uh, her care has been entrusted to another outcast who goes by the name of Roast. Um, and, uh, you know, over the course of the game, I think what, what we're meant to uncover is the history of Aloy and her relationship to the larger tribe who are legally restricted from speaking with her or interacting with her. Uh, and uh, also what happens to humanity and where these machines come from. Um, the first few hours of the game that I played are, are kind of an extended tutorial, but it's also a, a really strong setup for the world and the characters. And um, I, I think if you're not hooked within the first 90 minutes, um, you're probably not going to be into it. Uh, but there's a yeah, I was pretty I was pretty interested in, in seeing where this story goes um, in terms of the relationships and the overall world building. I, I think Guerrilla has set up a, a very interesting universe in which to play in. Uh, and it's also it also happens to be very pretty. They've done a very good job of of um, of kind of meshing this uh, uh, world of nature and futuristic technology. It's it's a it's a really nice looking neat game with a very solid premise. Fascinating. You you run this risk, I feel, as a developer when you when you go with a natural setting, right? It could right. just be anywhere. It's a sure. grassy field. It's a Rocky Canyon. I think perhaps some of the early levels in, in a game like Titanfall 2 suffered from some of that. But what has Guerrilla Games done to really make the, the landscape different and, and outstanding in this game? Because the, the screenshots in your article, which I'll, I'll link to in, in the show notes here, are just stunning. Well, you know, I think they've done a very good job of making the world just feel completely filled out with, with flora and fauna. Um, Everything's just nicely, brightly lit. There's, there's, unlike Killzone, which is you probably remember uh, up until Shadowfall, kind of a grim, dark, uh, grimy, oppressive feel to it. Uh, whereas in this game, every, there's a lot of color. Uh, it, the, the game seems to always take place at like sunrise or sunset or during a beautiful moonlit night. Um, people have these interesting tribal costumes that are made up of of animal hides and and uh, handmade fabrics, but also um, pieces of metal and technology that are, are ripped out of uh, these uh, machines that you fight against. Uh, so I, I think that the, all the characters have a very distinct look to them. Um, you know, the world is also just kind of, it's, it's a little bit hyper real in that, um, you know, I don't think they're being too slavish to, uh, you know, kind of nature as it's designed, kind of like, here's the caricature version or the super stylized version of nature as we like to see it just bursting with flowers and bright colors and uh you know streams and rivers and and uh beautiful mountain beds and and so i, I think that they've they've really stylized this world so that it um it just it just looks fantastic uh and they've also kind of peppered it with um ancient civilization ruins uh which would be our modern day so you'll see dilapidated buildings um you'll see uh bombed out cars and and rusted infrastructure um and so it just kind of it feels grounded but also serene and bucolic it's it's a it's a really nice looking game throughout um and then you know i think also the the design of the monsters uh helps um spice up this world too so you see these these creatures that basically have you know headlights for eyes and they're causing all this gorgeous lens flare effect on the screen and um, uh, it, yeah it's just a really nice looking game everything about it just just looks spectacular. Nice. Well, it seemed like a couple of years ago, like every other game that was coming out let you shoot a bow and arrow. That was like a thing sure. for a while. Yep. And that was something that jumped out <laughs> to everybody when this game was announced. Yeah. Um, but so tell me more about the weapons and Aloy and, and the powers that she's able to have, because I, I really have not, not kept up on this game at all, other than that, that initial trailer. 
Okay, so I, I, I've spent some time with some of the, the weapons in the game, um, and it does seem like the bow and arrow is a big uh, focus for her uh, in terms of combat. Um, you know, she, she has that from the get-go. Uh, she has kind of standard arrows, but um, I went on a mission and learned how to craft fire arrows. Um, and then I went on another mission and, and purchased uh, a device called the Rope Caster, which essentially puts down a, a cable on the ground that uh, has an electric shock running through it. And that can stun enemies. Uh, there's also a thing called, I think, the tie rope, um, which is essentially like a land-based harpoon weapon. Um, and these are all in service of kind of like hunting wildlife. Um, so she's kind of like a, you know, a one-woman hunting party. Um, but she's got the bow and arrow. She's also got a, a spear that she can use for close quarters combat and... Um, kind of stealth kills um but you know we've seen some other things too she's got a she's got a slingshot where she can fire uh you know incendiary um rounds and then i you know i saw that in the skill tree there's there are previews of some like heavy weapons so i saw her essentially walking around with a, a large grenade launcher cannon um so it seems like there's a lot to explore there i i feel like they're kind of keeping some of this stuff a little under wraps uh, so, so as not to spoil too much, but the arrow, uh, bone arrow based combat is a, is a big part of it. Um, and she also, you know, she has an extensive skill tree and there's a, a screenshot of the skill tree in, in the, the preview article that I wrote up. Um, but you know, a lot of her skills, uh, that can be added, uh, are things like kind of slowing down time when she's, when she's jumping or one hit kills when she's, um, jumping down on a on an enemy from a ledge uh or the ability to you know heal faster or um you know uh you know per perform more powerful critical strikes um but yeah you know i i think that a lot of this is is um bow and arrow based combat a lot of, of uh, you know quick dodging um but also studying your enemies you know she has this little device that looks not not unlike a little uh, bluetooth headset <laughs> um that lets her scan her environment um and it lets her uh, you know scan creatures for their elemental weaknesses um for which uh, components on their body might be vulnerable to attack um it also uh, will kind of illustrate their um their their walking pathway on the game world so if you need to sneak up on something you can scan an enemy and then you can see where it's going to go uh, and then you can sneak up behind it. Um, so there's there's a lot to the combat here, and I, I, f I feel like we really barely scratched the surface of it in our kind of four-hour preview of it. Uh, and I think that that's going to be the one of the more uh, interesting components to kind of dive into once we get uh, our hands on the final game. Well, it's coming to PlayStation 4. It's an exclusive to that platform, like you said, coming on uh, February 28th, so just a little over a month away. So take me a little bit further, though, into the transition of this project. You're going to hand this off to the, to the final reviewer. What are some of the things that you're going to, to make them aware of and some of the unanswered questions you've got before that review is final at the end of February? Well, you know, I think that that's kind of up to the reviewer. You know, I think um, in some cases we, we try and keep those uh, reviews and previews somewhat separate. Um, we'll... we'll We'll see. I mean, it's the it's we're still waiting on code. We haven't really had much discussion around how we're going to handle the review. Um, you know, Phil and Arthur, those guys are pros. They know what they know what they're doing. <laughs> um, so you know, I, I and I think that they've they've both uh, multiple people on staff have actually uh, you know DM'd me uh, in side conversations to say, hey, how is Horizon? Is is it any good? Um, and you know, the thing that I've been saying to them is like, hey, if you like this kind of like this you know, having a menu full of quests and uh, and upgrades and modifications and things to collect and study and, uh, and enjoy filling out these worlds and exploring huge maps, uh, then I think you're really going to love this game. Um, and I know that some people are really excited about that. Uh, you know, Samit Sarkar and Phil Kohler both DM'd me, and I, that was kind of the spiel that I gave them, and they both sounded pretty pretty amped up after, after my description. Um, so, you know, I think, uh, you know, I, I don't do a ton of reviews. Um, uh, I think we're going to leave this in the hands of people who are a little, a little more well-versed in these open-world adventure games. And, uh, and I guess we'll just see how it turns out in a couple weeks. 
Last question for you. I know that uh, last year you had the pleasure of uh, interviewing Hideo Kojima. This game runs on this Decima engine that Death Stranding is going to run on. So tell That's me right. about your experience with that. Well, I'll tell you, this is a very nice looking game. Um, <laughs> I would say that, uh, you know, based on what I've seen, uh, Kojima and company probably made the right call. Uh, you know, this is a game that I think can present a, a ton of different uh, ecosystems accurately, visually, uh, but also is useful for kind of the kind of, you know, mech based stuff that Kojima and Yoji Shinkawa love to put in their Metal Gear games and Zone of the Enders. Um, you know, this is this is a very nice looking, very well running engine. You know, you look at some of the footage of this game, you're getting huge draw distances. You know, you're getting a, a very stable frame rate. You're getting some beautiful lighting. I get to mess around with the photo mode in this game, which is available Ooh. anytime you pause it. Uh, and man, you can just you can just see the craft that went into designing the the, the lighting and the shaders and. All, all the foliage just looks amazing just like hiding and walking through these like blades of grass and flowers everything just looks so spectacular uh, and there are a couple things that you know maybe could look a little bit better uh, but this is a this is a big open world game and you know I, I, I think Guerrilla Games has has pretty much nailed it I, I think that it, I think that Death Stranding is, is probably going to be in good hands here Thank <laughs> you.